All right, it's the top of the hour, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the Integrate Professional Development webinar series. The Integrate project aims to promote faculty teaching about the earth in the context of society. Integrate is an NSF funded STEM talent expansion project. Its two overarching goals are first, to develop materials and curricula that are adoptable and adaptable for faculty to increase earth literacy for all undergraduates. And second, to increase majors in the geosciences and related fields to develop a workforce capable of tackling environmental and resource challenges. This webinar is part of a series supporting teaching with Integrate principles using the piloted and peer reviewed Integrate developed and curated materials as tools. Uh, on the screen and in the chat box, there's a link to the webinar event page where you can find the presentation slides, resources related to the presentation, and afterwards a recording of the webinar. If you have questions along the way, you can type them into the chat box. To access that, find the Zoom control bar and click on chat. Please, please leave your audio muted and video off and note that if you've joined from a browser, you may not be able to see some of these options. I'm happy to introduce today's speakers. Michelle Kinzel and Kara Thompson will be presenting Teaching Ocean Sustainability Using Active Learning Techniques. The webinar will cover the Integrate Ocean Sustainability Module, which introduces the importance of oceans, ocean processes, and the impacts of oceans on human health. Michelle and Kara will provide an overview of the units in the module, and we'll do an in-depth review of two of the module units. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we'll uh, do some group discussion about the Ocean Sustainability Module. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Kara. And then while she gets set up, uh, we'd like to hear from you. Uh, if you could, in the chat box, enter uh, what courses you're teaching. If you're currently teaching, have taught in the past, or will be teaching in the future, uh, we'd love to hear uh, what those courses are. All right, would you like me to go ahead and take over? Yeah, go ahead. All right. All right, well, thank you for that introduction, Mitchell. Um, so as you said, uh, Michelle and I are gonna present our ocean sustainability module uh, today. Our third co-author, Astrid Schnetzer, uh, could not be here. If you have any questions that uh, Michelle and I can't ask or can't answer, uh, we can get you in touch with, with her. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so as Mitchell mentioned, our um, our uh, module goals are to have students gain an appreciation for the complexity of ocean processes and the need to study them, um, but also become aware of our dependence on the ocean as well as our responsibility for the largest habitat on Earth. So the module itself, if you go to the um, if you go to the module page, You'll see that all the materials are there. Um, the module itself is made up of six units. Each of these units is um, designed to be taught in a 50 minute classroom session. Um, and uh, each activity within the unit has its own set time. So that helps kind of, it helps you kind of pace it throughout the class. Um, and then, each unit can be, a com um, can be designed to accommodate different class sizes. So whether you have a small class or a large class, it doesn't really matter. Um, it can be modified to, to accommodate that. Now, just a quick overview of our units. Um, units one and two um, are, uh, I'm gonna ask a quick question here, sorry. Can you guys see the video? Is it blocking the title of the slide? seems like the it's the video hasn't shown up yet it's a little okay frozen between the basic overview and yeah okay gotcha um so our uh first two units cover the physical and chemical aspects of the ocean um, our second two units um, cover how marine organisms are affected by modern oceanographic changes and then the last two units are really about um, mitigation strategies. Um, so I today will be covering unit one, and then I'll hand things over to Michelle who will be covering unit four. 
All right, so let's go ahead and get started with unit one. Um, if there are any questions, uh, Mitchell, if you could let me know. Um, all right, so unit one, ocean circulation and health. Um, the goals for the students uh, for this uh, activity or for this unit is to have them be able to describe how ocean, how global ocean currents affect coastal net primary productivity in fishing industries. But we also want them to be able to predict how ocean currents might be affected by modern climate change, as well as formulate hypotheses for how uh, regional parameters may change as a result of climate change as well. Um, so this unit starts out with um, a video um, of NASA's perpetual ocean, which I'll show here. Um, so this is a video that NASA compiled um, data to just show global ocean circulation patterns. And we'll turn it down just a little bit here. Um, this can be assigned, it's only a three minute long video. You can assign it to students um, as a pre-homework and have them take notes on it. Um, or you could just show it at the beginning of your classroom and have them take notes in the classroom. So what they should be doing is um, looking at the general patterns they see and thinking about what drives this ocean circulation pattern. So I'll go ahead and stop it here. And of course, um, so you have a, a discussion with your students about um, uh, the, the potential drivers um, or the actual drivers of, um, of ocean circulation, uh, which of course are wind, um, position of the continents, as well as the Coriolis effect. So that gets them set up for lateral ocean circulation. So then we start um, with activity 1.1. And at the start of activity 1.1, they get handed a worksheet um, that they'll be using throughout the entire class. So this covers activity 1.1, activity 1.2, and activity 1.3. Activity 1.1, upwelling and downwelling, sets up the basic rules for vertical um, ocean circulation. And it introduces the terms upwelling and downwelling. And it should take about 10 minutes uh, long. Uh, to cover uh, this activity. So we've already established by watching NASA's uh, perpetual ocean um, and uh, talking with the students that lateral currents are driven by wind and modified by continents in the Coriolis effect. But what drives vertical currents? Um, so upwelling and downwelling. Um, in that, the handout um, talks about um, uh, water density and the controls on water de density, of course, uh, water temperature and salinity, um, as well as um, convergence and divergence of those lateral currents, which can drive uh, vertical currents as well. Um, so the very first question that students address is they're given this map and they're just simply asked, where would we expect downwelling of water um, as a result of water temperature? Um, so if they've made the connections, they should know that cold water is more dense. So we would expect downwelling in the cold regions on Earth, which are, of course, close to our poles. So they just circle these regions and then, uh, and then move on. And then, uh, so one of the big things that drives um, upwelling and downwelling, of course, is convergence and divergence of currents. And so the handout explains, um, gives a quick, quick explanation of when we have lateral currents that come together or converge, this causes a pileup of water, which you can see here in the center. And then when they diverge, we tend to get a dip in the water level um, here. So, um, and we would expect whenever we have converging uh, currents, uh, that that would cause downwelling. And once the water hits the ocean floor, it spreads laterally, and then that um, water upwells wherever we have a dip in the water level. So this kind of sets up that idea for them. Um, and we also um, have this occur uh, whenever water is either converging or diverging with a continent. So here we have water um, that's moving to the right, um, it is converging with a continent on the right, so we get a pileup of water, and again, we get downwelling, and then lateral movement of that water close to the sea floor. And then where we have a dip in our water level, where we have water diverging from a continent, of course, we get upwelling. 
So this kind of sets this concept up for the students and then the students are asked a few questions and then they have to apply that. So here you can see for question six, we have converging currents. So we expect our water to downwell. And for question eight, we have diverging currents. So we expect our water to upwell here. So that sets up basic rules uh, for them. And um, activity 1.2 uh, introduces them to um, how vertical circulation acts as a control on bioproductivity. So this activity should take about 20 minutes or so. Now the first thing the students do is they count off individually from 1 to 16. So if you have uh, more than 16 students in your classroom, they just start over again at 1. Uh, when they get to 16. And so students uh, use this chart, it is in their handout, um, and they take note of the region that they're assigned to, um, and uh, their number as well. And then they take note of, um, so if they are an odd number, they work with the ocean currents map, and if they are an even number, they work with the net primary productivity map. And so let me show you these maps really quick. So the first one I'll show is the net primary productivity map here. Um, and this is basically, it shows a measure of chlorophyll concentration in the ocean. And uh, so students that are odd numbers have, um, have to identify in their region um, areas of high primary productivity. So they use this to, um, to identify those regions. Now students with even numbers, um, pay attention to this map and what they do is, uh, so this just shows our, our basic ocean circulation. Um, what they do is they look for areas where they might expect upwelling um, based on whether currents are converging with another current or with a continent. Um, so uh, they identify those separately. And by the way, these maps, um, I typically print them as black and white for students, and, um, but I, I project them in color, especially the bioproductivity map so that students are better able to identify um, those areas. So students, after, after determining this, um, they get together with a student, another student assigned to their region, and they address the following questions. So they compare their answers, and in that comparison, they're asked, they are asked, um, are there any discrepancies in your answers? So maybe um, their partner found a region of high bioproductivity maybe not related to upwelling or vice versa. Um, and then they are asked, well, what is maybe the source of these discrepancies? Um, so in other words, what other than upwelling might control uh, bioproductivity? And then they're asked to make the connection between uh, ocean currents, uh, lateral currents, upwelling and downwelling, and uh, the potential for a strong local fishing industry. So this really kind of pulls it back to, well, how does, it, how does this actually affect us um, and our um, economy and our, our um, food availability? So. Um, so that is activity uh, 1.2. Activity 1.3, so this is the last activity in unit one, um, has students uh, predict the effects of climate change on, change on ocean circulation and it introduces them to climate feedbacks as well. And this um, activity should take about 15 minutes. All right, so the very first thing um, in this activity is a really short five minute PowerPoint lecture. Um, and again, this is something that can be assigned before um, if you don't like to lecture in class. Um, but I just give, I figure it's, it's short enough. I give it, um, go ahead and lecture to the students. And this lecture introduces students to the concept of Earth's reservoirs or spheres. As you can see, we have our um, five spheres here on the right. And it also introduces them to what a flux is, which is a process that moves matter from one reservoir to another. And then we, uh, of course, give them a good example of a flux, uh, which probably the easiest one for them to understand is evaporation, uh, which moves water or matter from the hydrosphere to the atmosphere. And then we have students come up, well, with a 
what is a human driven flux? What are humans doing um, nowadays on a large scale that is moving matter from one uh, reservoir to another? And uh, one of kind of the best examples of this is uh, combustion. And so we talked to them about how, um, how humans are uh, burning fossil fuels and that's moving material from the geosphere to the atmosphere. And then um, lastly, we introduced students to feedbacks um, and feedback loops. And um, the best way to introduce is to give them an example. And the example that I like to, to start with is a temperature increase. Um, so we'll start with that initial change of a uh, temperature increase. And that a secondary change from that, of course, is polar ice caps melt. And that causes the Earth to become less reflective. It lowers our albedo. Um, so therefore, Earth absorbs more heat. And because we absorb more heat, or because the Earth absorbs more heat, um, that causes further temperature increase. And so I introduced this feedback as a positive feedback loop where the original change, which was Earth's temperature increasing, is actually enhanced. Um, I also introduce a negative feedback loop where the initial change is diminished. This works more, of course, like a thermostat, um, where uh, if we have Earth's temperature increasing, you can ask students, what does that do to uh, evaporation of water on the Earth's surface? And they should say, well, evaporation should increase. And then you can talk to them about, well, if we have more um, water vapor in the atmosphere, how does that affect our cloud coverage? Our cloud coverage should increase. And then we all know on a sunny day, um, when a cloud comes overhead, it cools off um, the surface of the Earth, and so Earth's temperature should decrease. So here, our initial change in temperature was actually uh, diminished. All right, so the last part of um, Activity 1.3 um, provides students with a short article um, published by NASA Goddard uh, Space Flight Center in 2013 that uh, talks about how modern climate change is affecting the ocean's ability to take up carbon from the atmosphere. And um, so I've just shown a, a really small part of it here um, on the slide. It's, it's a little bit longer than this. Um, but we, have, we give students a little bit of time to read over this article. And then what they need to do is um, apply their new knowledge to um, a feedback loop, to building a feedback loop um, to basically describe what the article um, outlines. Um, so I like to give uh, students this, um, which gives them the boxes for our, uh, our different parts of the feedback loop, um, but also gives them a couple of clues. Um, so we start with atmospheric temperature increase uh, on the top here, um, which drives seawater temperature increase. And because we have uh, seawater temperature increasing, we have less upwelling of nutrient-rich deep water. And by now, students should know that affects uh, bioproductivity. So our bioproductivity could decrease, and that would decrease our carbon burial um, through lower production of organic matter, a lower production and burial of organic matter. And then that um, would uh, increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because the ocean's not taking up quite as much. Um, now, uh, this feedback loop, this could actually be presented in a little more loose way if you just want to have students come up with it um, by themselves instead of giving them this really structured uh, version of it. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever works for you, the materials available and each unit are completely modifiable. So um, you kind of, um, you uh, can work with it the way that you want to, All right? Uh, so with that, I'll hand, over, um, hand it over to Michelle, who's gonna present uh, unit four. Thank you, Kara. <clears throat> okay, and 
uh, I will jump right in. And uh, unit four is entitled Oceans in Peril, uh, Pressures on Ocean Ecosystems. And the focus of this unit is looking at gray whales and examining potential links between their behavior and changed ocean conditions. And uh, by doing this, students are able to infer the ecological role that gray whales play within that community and an ecosystem. So we've all heard the phrase, the canary in the coal mine, and one of the things that we can do is look at animal species and how they are making major behavioral changes, and that helps us understand what can be happening with our earth systems uh, in, in, a, in a larger sense. So gray whales are very easy to study because they are a coastal whale and they have a very well-defined and described migratory behavior. So we know where they are and when to expect them. So any shifts that we see in their behavior of timing of migration or population uh, can be useful for then going into the examination of what's happening with their environment that's causing these changes. So in unit four uh, for activities, the students will summarize main concepts uh, and scientific evidence, data, and observations cited, all in the attempt to justify why gray whales can be considered ecosystem sentinels. So that title sentinel means uh, that the gray whales are heralding a change or a shift in that environment. So these slides here are showing you um, on the left we have uh, a feedback loop of uh, climate change similar to the one that Kara described and um, this one is looking at uh, increase in ocean temperature related to global sea levels. So I'm going to go through that. I'll step through that in detail. And then on the right is another example of some of the structure and organization that you'll find in these units. So this lays out uh, the scientific study and then there are facts listed, uh, an interpretation of observation, and then a question for the students. So one of the great things about the integrate modules is that it emphasizes systems thinking and interdisciplinary approach. So there are lots of guidelines for you as teachers to encourage your students to be putting pieces of information together and not just memorizing those facts that they might read in their books or see in lecture. Sorry for that. Uh, so the learning goals, uh, these are presented with every unit and that's a really good launching place for you to decide if this unit is suitable for you. Again, uh, most great teachers will adapt and modify materials to suit their needs and by reading the learning goals you can see where it will fit into your curriculum. So for unit four, the students are looking at common data sets and principles that are used to study climate change and this includes global temperatures, atmospheric CO2, warming ocean temperatures, the melting of glaciers and sea ice, and rising sea levels. And students are guided to identify scientific data and evidence as distinguished from interpretations. So this can be applicable to oceanography topics, it can be used in teaching the scientific method, and it can be looking at helping students distinguish between what is evidence and what is actual interpretation of an evidence. And for the next bullet point, the students will cite evidence that's related to climate change from various articles and that affects systems on an organismal as well as an ecosystem level. And scientific articles have been condensed into one student reading assignment for upper level or graduate courses you could assign the original peer-reviewed articles for students to read and then finally uh, through a gallery walk students will correlate their scientific evidence and possible interpretations and then look at what that means for the whale behaviors related to climate change this assignment also has a pre-class assignment and this is just the first two pages of the summary. There were uh, six scientific articles that were condensed and put into one summary reading. Again, uh, this is uh, appropriate for an introductory level course and certainly uh, maybe other university courses and if you are teaching graduate students, you could assign those specific articles to the students to read. 
Students also have a worksheet to go with their reading. And uh, this is an example of one of the questions. So uh, looking at how do the factors affect the behavior of the gray whale and then having students determine is this a direct or indirect influence. So this is a map showing the locations of the articles referenced in the summary reading and uh, students need to find the article and then match up the uh, geographic location uh, with the research study. So this is a really great example of having students understand the importance of where and how different things and different factors on the earth affect living organisms in different ways. So here is a chart that they fill out and this chart is important because their responses will be used in class during the gallery walk. So for timing considerations, the pre-class assignment is very important so that students can really consider all of the information, think it through, and this chart guides them into summarizing and condensing the information that they'll be then sharing on their posters during the gallery walk. And I will explain and show you an example of what a gallery walk looks like in a few slides. So here is, I'm going to go through um, just a couple. I won't touch on all six of the articles, but one of them um, does talk about gray whale global distribution. And again, the gray whale file follows a migration route that you can see by this red line here. They are one of the medium sized whales and they're always within uh, three to five kilometers of shore so they're very easy for us to observe. They also have a known migration route where they have feeding grounds that they occupy during the northern hemisphere's winter and they have summer breeding grounds that they occupy during uh, our northern hemisphere's summer. So they're very easy to identify and find and we know where they are and uh, where they will be at certain times of the year. So this life cycle follows their migratory and feeding behaviors. Again, uh, during the summer, they stay where the food source is rich in the feeding grounds of the higher latitudes. During the fall, they're traveling southbound and uh, heading for the breeding lagoons. And the trigger for that is when the ice is forming. Uh, so you can see the potential connection there with if there's a reduction in sea ice, there may be a delay in migration. And then they occupy the mating and calving grounds in Baja, California, Mexico in January through March. They return their migration in the spring and the migration occurs between January to June where they go and return to their feeding grounds. So when we want to tie this into environmental factors, um, again, I touched upon the sea ice. So a reduction in sea ice allows gray whales to have more access to feeding grounds in the Arctic. So uh, one of the ob observations is that some of the whales are not completing their migration. Rather, they're staying in the northern higher latitudes. And following the reduction in sea ice, a greater number of calves were counted on the northbound migration. So whether or not there's a correlation between those two facts is something that students can uh, explore. And you can touch upon whether it's direct or indirect evidence. So a direct effect might be the extent of the sea ice affecting timing, whereas an indirect effect might affect the numbers of calves born or population density. The feedback loop that I showed earlier uh, goes something like this. So we start with an increase in ocean temperatures in the bottom left corner. As reflective ice disappears, the darker ocean waters are absorbing more heat and reflecting less of sun's energy. And the temperatures then rise. Uh, in a response to rising temperatures, the Arctic sea ice melts and we have an increase in global sea levels. So when we want to tie these in to uh, indirect and direct behaviors, with this example of a polar bear, after the Arctic sea ice is melting, there is a reduced amount of habitat. This leads to food shortages. And thus, there is a reduced polar bear cub survival. With less nutrients and less food available in the environment, the mothers are no longer able to sustain and raise their young. 
You can also tie it into the systems thinking. So uh, each of the systems here are, are touched upon the hydrosphere, the hydrosphere and the cryosphere, atmosphere, um, and then the biosphere. So each of those labels is showing you where in this feedback you could talk about those systems and then um, looking at systems thinking how they're linked in and affect one another. Other environmental factors that are explored in the student reading is a regime shift. So uh, in the Pacific, uh, there's a decadal oscillation and it results in a major reorganization of biota in the Northeast Pacific. So this Pacific decadal oscillation, abbreviated PDO, is a long-term ocean fluctuation. And there are cool and warm phases oscillating every 20 to 30 years. One of the articles that is summarized indicates that during the 1970s warm phase, the gray whales actually showed a one week delay in southbound migration. So this can be important because the timing of the migration is spread out throughout the population and they do their breeding and the birthing of calves in the southern lagoons. So if the females are delaying their time, um, they can actually be having calves along the migration route, which does happen, but it's not ideal. So a little bit more about the environmental factors. Um, the article touches upon warm El Nino and cold La Nina extremes. And the definition here of um, El Nino is covered um, as being a disruption of the ocean atmosphere system and it causes ocean temperatures to increase by a few degrees. So the scientific article that studied El Nino effects showed that mothers and calves show a change in occupancy and departure time from the breeding lagoons in response to these extremes. So timing is very critical, again, in several aspects, not only for the adults to be mating, but also for the females to be making the migration north with their calves. They have a lot of considerations like environmental factors and predators and um, the delay in timing could have an overall effect on the population. So what is an ecosystem sentinel? Again, it's just an animal that serves as an indicator of the health of the system. So uh, a quote here by Aguirre and Tabor et al. Uh, shows that um, seabirds and marine mammals are conspicuous animals and they integrate changes in ecosystem and this can reflect the existing state of the environment. So to understand what's happening with changes, we can look at these animals and study what they um, are shifting in their behavior. So I'm going to talk briefly about the logistics of a gallery walk. If you've never used one, it's a technique that gets students out of their chairs and it's a very interactive mode of engagement. So one of the great advantages is that there's a lot of flexibility and the students are really talking to each other and they are sharing their thoughts and ideas. Um, this is really great for pulling out those students who may be intimidated by speaking out in class and some students will speak more freely and share with each other than they will with a professor. So the arrangement of this gallery walk is that uh, there is a group assignment and each group has a concept or a change in whale behavior assigned to them and then they need to compare the evidence that they found in their readings. There are station rotations, so there are six stations that are set up um, and this corresponds to the six group assignments and at each station or poster they will list evidence interpretation or the change in the environment that they read about, the category of the life cycle that is most affected by this change, and then a review and comment on the post on the postings that came in numbers one through three at that station. And then finally, a group report. If there is time, you can orally summarize the evidence and interpretation for the class at your original station. Here's a design template, and um, this is showing uh, four stations when, in fact, um, there are six, but for simplicity of the slide, I only included four. And uh, the different station topics here are underlined, and we have southbound migration at station one, 
calf numbers and lagoon occupancy, the feeding year round and the gray whale calls. Again, these are all topics that correlate directly with those scientific articles. And I've just shown an arrangement around the room and you can see on the left would be your screen or your whiteboard representing uh, the traditional front of the classroom and then the stations are actually posters either the large sticky note posters or butcher paper uh, taped onto the wall and um, at the center of the room you can also have wall poster versions or tabletops if you have a uh, larger group for instance that is not conducive to working on um, the walls. So just a couple of tips at the bottom, the instructor can label the station number and the scientific study, which is underlined in the boxes here. And then the students fill in that evidence, interpretation, and life cycle from their homework. It's really important that they have this ready to go. Again, with timing, they need to have those steps thought out and be able to identify that evidence and their interpretation of it before they start the activity. Here's an example of what a completed station poster might look like. So the title is South Southbound Migration for Station 1, and the evidence that they found is a one-week delay in southbound migration as noted by coastal whale counts. So here they're talking about what did the scientists see and a very brief mention of the how did they collect that data. Their interpretation is that in response to the late 1970s regime, regime shift in the North Pacific, this is a very truncated example. They don't need to write long paragraphs on these posters. And then finally, the life cycle affected is migration. Uh, so a tip, you can pre-label posters to save time. And then again, the box on the right is indicating the portion that the students fill out from their homework. So in summary, um, one of the primary goals of this module is for students to really understand the role that humans are playing in altering marine systems and their inhabitants. And these are not always direct cause and effect. There can be several layers of complexity. And by examining things this way, students can recognize the power that we have as students and a society to work towards practices that will sustain our ocean. So again, here is the list of the uh, six units and um, the module summary. And so um, at this time, um, I just would like for you to take a moment and then think about um, which units might be useful for you. They all have different activities in them and they are all adaptable. And if you can raise your hand uh, in the chat box, I'm sorry, there's a poll that is coming up now. Um, and uh, which units are you most likely to explore for your class? And I see some of you, some of the responses are coming in. And it's like a very digital racehorse here. And we have a lot of unit one and two, okay. And unit four is lagging a little bit behind, but trying to keep up. So, okay, so uh, just interesting to know. And um, you're most familiar at this point with unit one and unit four. I would encourage you to explore the other units that there's a lot of content that may not be represented just by that title. And um, just uh, please do have a look through the units and see what's going to be useful for your class. I'm going to go ahead and end the polling and I'm going to share the results with you now so we can see that unit one was the overall winner um, and um, this is also a good thing. Unit one and unit two are very good introductory units for the other modules. Okay. So these activities are a great fit for oceanography, physical geography, marine biology or marine science, environmental science and earth science and sustainability. And there are, there are several other uh, sustainability series of modules available through CERC. Uh, this is just one of them.
There's also a community support page. So one of the great things about going to conferences or networking with teachers who have used materials that may be new for you is that ability to ask questions. And so if you are able to log in uh, to this community support page, you can ask questions and the authors will be moderating it um, as well as some representatives from Integrate and uh, it's a really great place to ask for tips or insight um, on ways to modify your teaching or uh, ways to make the units work for you. And then finally, if you want to dive in more, you can immerse your department or school in a traveling workshop program and leaders from the CERC Integrate community can come to your site and go in depth. You'll see here um, that there are themes that are listed in the middle of this screenshot. And so um, they, the traveling workshop program can cover uh, strengthening your department, working on your curriculum, um, looking at um, effective and society relevant courses and other topics. And so if you're interested in a professional development for your staff, you can also include colleges and universities from your local area. This is a really, really great um, NAGT sponsored program that can help you get some hands-on training. Okay, and I'm gonna stop sharing here now and I'm going to turn it back over to Mitchell for a question and answer session. Thank you for joining us. And I look forward to working and learning uh, with all of you. So as Michelle mentioned, uh, we'd love to hear some of your, get some of your input uh, and hear from you. Uh, so for our discussion today, we're uh, hoping to ask this question and get some responses. Uh, and that is, what are the biggest challenges in connecting students to our oceans and the importance of ocean health? Um, so any challenges that you've faced in your teaching uh, or challenges that you foresee, um, we'd love to hear what your thoughts are and you can enter those into the chat box. Uh, in the meantime, we have a question from Elizabeth uh, asking if we could briefly, if someone could briefly summarize Unit 6. Michelle, do you want me to do that? Oh, I think Michelle's muted. Okay. I'm not muted anymore. Go ahead, Kara. Okay. Um, so Unit 6, uh, let's see, I haven't looked at it for about a, a little while. Um, so unit six has uh, students evaluate the um, iron fertilization hypothesis for enhancing uh, carbon burial and enhancing uh, ocean absorption of CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, that would be like my one sentence summary of it. Michelle, would you add anything to that? I think she's muted again. <laughs> Sorry, Kara. Yes. Um, you know what? And um, I am going to jump in here and look really quickly uh, at the unit itself and give me some talking points. So uh, unit six uh, really looks at uh, geoengineering. And so um, students are able to examine what's happening with the carbon cycle and food web dynamics. And then they look at examples of geoengineering strategies, which Kara touched upon was the iron um, ocean fertilization. And then they talk about the pros and cons of humans taking an active role in an ocean system like that. So there are scientific explorations of um, previous iron fertilization um, strategies that have um, been attempted in order to supply the oceans with more nutrients with the idea that um, the fertilization of the food web will increase the amount of nutrients available. Um, let's see. So the students will look at uh, temperature and carbon chemistry and, and how this interacts with those biological processes. So the unit that Kara introduced, unit one and two, once the students have a good grasp on ocean 
uh, temperatures and carbon chemistry, they can examine what is the current state of how climate change is happening. And then this unit really looks at that human participation and um, has students examine what can we do about it. So we've gotten, while you were answering, we've gotten some really great uh, comments on our discussion question. Uh, a number of them are related to familiarity with oceans and student interaction with oceans, uh, especially from students in say the Midwest or uh, in other places where they're disconnected from oceans and don't really have much, uh, much experience with oceans. I, I have that same issue too. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I teach right now at um, Arizona State University and uh, before I, I taught here I taught at Santa Monica College and I, I definitely took for granted the amount of knowledge that Santa Monica College students had about the ocean because they lived there. Um, and when I came to ASU, you, you can definitely tell a difference in, in how connected they are with the importance of our, of our oceans, for sure. Um, so part of the way, way I tackle that is um, there are some great documentaries um, that I suggest to students. I'll post them on, um, on our website. Um, on our classroom website and uh, and I you know I get a lot of student feedback from those like they just didn't realize what was going on with our oceans. So I'm just going to jump in here. I'm seeing some of the comments about uh, the disconnect and I, I think that that is so common with students in all aspects of earth science and oceanography. And um, some of you are really making great points about ways that you approach that. And I really do believe that with the power of uh, the internet, and especially with our video capabilities and digital tools that we have, I don't think um, we actually need to be in the environment in order to really let students experience that. Uh, obviously, I'm a big fan of field work. I think it's, you know, the best way to learn about the earth is to be out in it. But um, let's see, Horatio mentions remote sensing. That's a great idea. And um, some of the other discussions about uh, you know, looking at the, the data sets and um, one, I forget who it was, but somebody talked about the economic tie-in. So if you are in a coastal town, um, students will have that connection if they, if their livelihood depends upon harvesting resources from the ocean, that's a, that's an easy connect. And I think making those connections can happen even if you aren't near the ocean. Does anyone else have any questions about any of the other units or uh, in the chat box, if you can put in there, does anyone have any plans immediately to explore a unit? Maybe even just poking around on the website and looking further? I'm checking out this March for the Ocean okay. website. Okay, so uh, Katie asked about the marine protected areas. So uh, the marine protected areas, the students learn about uh, what they are and uh, the a little bit of the political, uh, not the process for designating a marine protected area, but some of the statistics of where they're located and what it is, the difference between a protected area and a reserve. And then the students look at some scientific studies that, that have documented the benefits of a protected area and a reserve. So they look at increase in biomass, increase in biodiversity. So they're really going through the data set of what happens when you protect an area. 
then their group activity is to form into different groups and they are different stakeholders and then they are tasked with designating a certain amount of area in the Channel Islands. Um, so the Channel Islands Marine Reserve is very uh, well developed and a very rigorous marine protected area. So the students will consider different factors, different perspectives, uh, such as fishermen, recreational uses, politicians, uh, oceanographers. And um, I think we have a group of students that we call whale huggers. And they actually go through and they say, these are the areas that we're going to protect. They draw it out on a map and then they have to give justification of why. Uh, so they have to say, uh, they have to list the physical variables of why they're protecting this area. Is it because it's in shallow water? Is it because of ocean currents? Is it because of kelp beds? Is it because of fishing stocks? Um, and then they, um, they go through and they compare that to the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary maps and they look and see where their decisions were made and what's already come down the pipeline. So just to sum that all up, they look at the factors of marine reserves, how they benefit the environment and the populations. Then they propose their own reserve and defend that. And their defense has to be based on physical environments as well as societal and economical. And then they compare that to what's already in place. And this is all for the Channel Islands. From Matt, do you grade or comment on the group work? Yes. So there's different assessments that are included. If you look at the Sir Carlton website, uh, there's all different forms of assessment. There are some rubrics for actually grading on a points system, some of the activities, and um, there is um, a possibility to do participation points. So for something like the gallery walk that I mentioned, I would not be punitive in my points because a lot of it is interpretation and really encouraging students to peer-to-peer -peer share. So I do a lot of participation points for a gallery walk. I combine that with a rubric and a guided, uh, when they turn in their pre-homework, that's where I can really go through and grade their points. Um, you had a question earlier, Michelle, from Lorraine Carey. Uh, she wants to know, um, do all the students read the summaries before class for unit four, or are they assigned groups beforehand and just read that? I have the students read through everything, so they are responsible in their homework for doing all of the six scientific studies. When they get to class, they're assigned one that then they take ownership of. And so uh, that's a really great question. They all need to be familiar with all of the studies because they need to then go through in their gallery walk rotations and they need to comment at the final station rotation on whether or not they agree with what's been written. Uh, they need to, they can put in, you know, oh, you missed this aspect or this point. So absolutely they, uh, as pre-homework, they're responsible for all of them and then um, initially, they put up their homework answers into their assigned stations. And I think we have a question from Alexa, who's thought about taking our class to the shed in Chicago. Has anybody had success in these sorts of field trips in an intro to oceanography class? Um, I know I, I have taken students, I haven't taken them to an actual aquarium, but I, I, when I taught oceanography at Santa Monica College, I took them on a, a field uh, trip to a, an estuary. And we had, we had several stops, so we started at an estuary and then ended up on the beach. And that went really well. In fact, um, I had probably 75 or 80 percent of my students who would attend it. Um, so I had decent attendance, uh, but I haven't done one to an aquarium. How about you, Michelle? I have. And uh, in fact, I've done both field work at the beach and I've done an aquarium. At the aquarium, I tend to give them a self-led scavenger hunt. 
uh, because in the aquarium, unless they're doing observations of organisms or animals, there aren't usually a lot of opportunities for field data collection. Here in San Diego, we do have a nature center that does teach a class on ocean chemistry and uh, tides. And so they have to we have to pay a fee for that. I haven't explored that yet, but there are options like that out there. And then I do a field trip to the beach where I have students do wave dynamics. So I have them estimate wave height, wave period, wave speed, and we compare that with a local weather report and a surf report, and then I make them do uh, algebra equations. And they grumble a little bit, but when they're sitting when they're sitting by the beach with seagulls around they don't grumble too much so i think that the, the idea is absolutely field trips are in my opinion it's the best way you know the best way to learn about an environment is to be out in it and just uh, if you feel free to email me if you have any questions about um other ways um and things um that i've done i think the key is to really get students to be the scientists and to be collecting their data. And you don't need fancy equipment. Um, ocean chemistry can be a little tricky, I think, but if you can, um, I'm sure the Shedd Aquarium has uh, interactive um, exhibits and they, they can um, do a scavenger hunt and look for scientific facts and that could be their data collection. Oh, and Mitchell also says, yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, and Kara, Kara, Mitchell says, put your questions in the ocean sustainability yeah. teaching discussion. That's a great question is, have you had success on field trips? And then Kara has put her email and I have as well. Uh, feel free to send me uh, emails. I would be happy to send you my, um, it's the uh, uh, Stephen Birch, I'm, aquarium in La Jolla <laughs> and it's it's a scavenger hunt for students there, there's one more quick question I want to address um, from Matt uh, how many students are there in your class so I ran a class um, with 45 students I ran all the units in that class we are co-author um, Astrid Schnetzer how many people were in her how many students were in her class Michelle oh didn't she have 60? I, I thought it was closer to 100. Maybe 90, that yes. Big lecture hall. She And she was able to run the units in her class as well. Um, and I don't, what was the size of your um, classes? So, so my class was, um, I, I taught it for two classes, uh, about 30 in each. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it, 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 it gets more it can get more complicated with larger classes, but there are ways to adapt it where you aren't doing everything as a group. So you can do breakouts um, and there are tips in the modules. And again, um, you could email Astrid. Um, I'm going to look up her email here and um, you can, you can contact her and ask her specifically or uh, post it. Actually, you know, I'm going to I'm going to promote the ocean sustainability teaching discussion. If you post something up there, I'm sure Astrid will respond to you and answer questions for how she modified things. Oh, thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Alexa. All right. Looks like we covered all the questions. I yeah, think looks so. like the questions are slowing down and we're just about out of time. So uh, really quickly, uh, thank you, Michelle and Kara, for giving a great webinar. And thank you to everyone who attended today. Um, I've thrown some upcoming opportunities on the screen. Uh, we have another upcoming webinar on the mineral resources module, and that's next week. Um, as Michelle mentioned, consider your department or program for traveling workshops program. Uh, and if you want to hear more about similar topics, uh, we encourage you to come to the Earth Educators Rendezvous uh, this summer in July. Um, as we mentioned, the Ocean Sustainability Teaching Discussion Group is open, and we encourage you to ask questions, share your experiences, um, share how you've adapted these resources or supporting materials we use. Um, and finally, we appreciate your feedback. Uh, so if you're willing, 
I will post a link to a webinar evaluation uh, in the chat box and we'd love to hear, hear back from you about that. I've added a number of links to some of these resources in the chat box just now. Uh, so again, thank you and we hope to see you at a future webinar. Thank you everybody for joining. Your time is very valuable and we uh, really appreciate uh, you, uh, your interest and for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Mitchell, do you want us to stay on? Uh, no, I think if, if people have questions, uh, you've given them some ways to contact you and they can also use the, the teaching discussion. Uh, and I'll send an email out once the, the webinar is posted to the, the web page. Oh, thank you, Alexa. Okay, thank you very much, Mitchell. Great. Thank you, Karen, for being here. And allowing us to share. Thank you, NJ.